Let's pray before we look at the book of Amos. Hopefully we'll finish up the book of Amos this evening, and uh, we'll see how that goes. Father, we thank you for your prophets, the, the men who were willing to take your word and proclaim it to people. Uh, Father, uh, help us to be faithful to do that as well, in good and bad. Uh, Lord, in, in what we think is nice and great, and Lord, in what we think is hard and difficult, yet, Lord, we know that you have your purpose in every part. And Father, help us to be faithful. In Christ's name, amen. So, Amos gets the job of telling the bad news, okay? Um, and, I, I, you know, I, I, I've tried to stop and think about that. Um, one of the things that I'm still trying to work on is, why do we have so much material during this period, okay? The period of the kings and chronicles and the prophets. God seems to have just packed in a lot of books. And, in thinking through that, you realize 400 silent years. I mean, it must have been like deafening silence. God all of a sudden just stops. Well, that's going to come up before we're done tonight in a different way. But uh, Amos gets sent out. He, he talks about how sin upon sin upon sin upon sin for three, even four transgressions all over the place, he circles it right in and finally puts the pin in Israel and tells them that, that God's upset at them because they have despised the law of the Lord. Um, they had the tremendous privilege of being God's chosen people, of being told how to worship him, and they despised it. Uh, Ju Judah and Israel as well. Um, God had chosen them out of all the families of the earth. And because of that, he was going to punish them like no one else. Um, the response needed to be seek and live, um, to grieve over the right things at the right time, uh, to realize that God's word, the standard was there, and that judgment was coming. So I'm um, still not quite where we're going to be. Um, the amazing thing about Amos, he's just a sheep breeder. He's just an ordinary guy who God said go, and he did. He went. Um, and that brings us to chapter 8. Okay, Amos chapter 8. We're going to try and finish the last two chapters. I, I think we should be able to do that. Um, so hopefully we'll have time at the end to interact. Okay. Wake up your brains. <laughs> All right. Chapter 8. Then the sovereign Lord showed me another vision. In it I saw a basket filled with ripe fruit. What do you see, Amos? He asked. I replied, O oh Lord God, I can see your impending judgment coming upon this heart. No, no. Amos is just like, I see a bowl of ripe fruit. <laughs> I'm like, praise God. That's exactly what I would have said. And the Lord said, like this fruit, Israel is ripe for punishment. I will not delay their punishment again. And remember, Amos had pleaded for them in the, the first visions. And, and God said, okay, you're right. I relent. I'll wait. And then again, and then again. And then the plumb line, and he's like, no, it's got to come. And here he's given them the vision of the, the ripe fruit and saying, nope, I will not delay their punishment again. In that day, the singing in the temple will turn to wailing. Dead bodies will be scattered everywhere. That's just telling them, it, 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 this is serious. This, this isn't going to be a little thing. They will be carried out of the city in silence. I, the sovereign Lord, have spoken. Listen to this, you who rob the poor and trample down the needy. You can't wait for the Sabbath day to be over and the religious festivals to end so you can get back to cheating the helpless. All right, so realize what he's saying here that these are religious people <laughs> they're observing the sabbath they're observing the religious holidays but their heart is oh how long will this go on 
Can't we get this over so we can get back to cheating people? And again, before we get too self-righteous and say, well, shame on them, we should probably say, shame on us. How often do we, oh, I've got to go to church, or I've got to do this, or I've got to serve the Lord today. I, 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 honestly, you know, I get paid to come. <laughs> and still there are days that I'm like, huh, oh, right? It, it is our human flesh rising up, resisting the Spirit of God and serving Him with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our joy, all our strength, right? <laughs> Keeping us from committing totally, 100%. You measure out grain with dishonest measures and cheat the buyer with dishonest scales and you mix the grain you sell with chaff swept from the floor. <sighs> right? These are, they are definitely cheating. God hates a dishonest scale. You enslave poor people for one piece of silver or a pair of sandals. Now the Lord has sworn this oath by his own name, the pride of Israel. Now, I'm reading from the New Living Translation because somewhere in here I messed up and started copying the wrong translation into my notes. Um, but that caught me by surprise. Uh, I think you have, uh, um, what, what is it? Something of Judah. or The end of verse 7, Now the Lord has sworn this oath by his own name, the pride of Israel. What is? The, yeah. The excellency of Jacob, yeah. Um, I, I don't think that the New Living Translation is way out of whack here, but that term, the pride of Israel, actually shows up in the next book that we're going to study, which is Hosea. It shows up twice. It, it seems like an odd name for Jehovah. The, the pride of Israel, the one whom Israel, who Judah, should look at and say, wow, we have this this is our God. Now, th th this, should be, this should be the thing that we, we boast about. This should be the thing that we, we treasure. This, this is our God. And yet, what did they do? They, they done everything wrong. I will never forget the wicked things you have done. The earth will tremble for your deeds. And everyone will mourn. The ground will rise like the Nile River at flood time. It will heave up and sink again. Verse 9. In that day, says the Sovereign Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth while it is still day. All right? So you, you've experienced probably in your lifetime some point where all of a sudden you noticed that it's not as bright as it should be, when it should be. Either storm clouds have just come in and, and just kind of made things, whoa, we've got something going on. Eclipse, you know, some of those really wild things. And God says, look, I, I will get their attention. I will, I will make it dark at noon. All right, when it, not, when it should not be. I will turn your celebrations into times of mourning, your singing into weeping. You will wear funeral clothes and shave your heads to show your sorrow as if your only son had died. How very bitter that day will be. And as I'm reading, I'm thinking, so is he trying to foreshadow here? What would be great bitterness and what will be required for real forgiveness? That your only son would die. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> but he, 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 he brings this in as if your only son had died. The time is surely coming, says the Sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine of bread or water but of hearing the words of the Lord. People will stagger, people will stagger from sea to sea and wander from border to border searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. Beautiful girls and strong young men will grow faint in that day thirsting for the Lord's word. Those who swear by the shameful idols of Samaria, who take oaths in the name of the God of Dan, make vows in the name of the God of Beersheba, they will all fall down. Never to rise again. All right, so. 
This should make us pause. It made me pause. What if you could not find a copy of God's Word? What if, diligently seeking, you couldn't find a Bible? Which is really almost beyond my imagination at this point. Right? I can't tell you how many Bibles I have in my office. I actually put some of them out for someone else to take because I had so many and I know I wasn't using them. I can't tell you how many Bibles we have in our house. We've got more than we are, more than there are of us. And then there's my phone and my computer. How? How? But more importantly, what would you do? What would you do if you could not verify the truth that God has given us? You know, I've heard and read stories of you know, prisoners of war who, from memory, wrote down, scratched out verses, traded them back and forth. You know, and you're thinking, this is amazing. This is, this is great. God's word survives, right? And we do have this promise. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. Right? And so um, David Gusick said, quoted um, uh, another commentator. It says, this is, it's not that the word of God can't be found. It's that the hearer can't find it can't hear it okay um and whether that's exactly the way that is or not does it terrify you (laughs) to think what if i could not get to the word of god there is a lot i take for granted because I have been trained in God's Word, and I know God's Word, and I know I can get back to God's Word, and I know my memory is, sometimes is a little faulty, but I can get back to, and I can, I can verify, wow, this is the Word of the Lord. But what? If you couldn't. And this is part of the, the curse that God's bringing upon them. Right? They, they refuse to hear, And so God pulls, God grants their wish. Oh, I don't want to hear that. Really? Um, 1 Thessalonians 2.13, the right way to hear the word of God. When you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, The word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. Um, Matthew 4, 4. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So uh, a famine of hearing God's word is ultimately worse than a famine of bread. Right? Um, Let me remind you of this. The parable of the soil. Right? But listen as I read Mark chapter 4, or follow along as I read Mark chapter 4, and we talk about it being the conditions of the heart, and I think it is, but it's very much a condition of the ear and the heart. Um, so I came across, I was looking for a good graphic, and I came across this one in, I'm assuming it's Latin. Um, but it just reminded me, my brain is just really weird. I understand it. But it just reminded me that it's not just that the Bible was then, way back then, and the Bible is now, right? This, this has been a story, a parable, that God's used throughout the ages, right? And yet we still, we still miss it. We still don't entirely get it. Um, Mark chapter 4. Jesus um, tells the parable 
And he finishes it in Mark chapter 4, verse 9. He said to them, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parable. And he said to them, To you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, all things come in parables. So that, seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. Right? So, if you're not going to treat God's word as God's word, if you're not going to receive it, beware. Verse 13, he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. These are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground, who when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness. They have no root in themselves, and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Now these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desires for other things. Entering in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. But these are the ones sown on good ground. Those who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit. Some 30-fold, some 60, some 100. The hearing doesn't stop there. He goes on. Also, he said to them, is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? Is it not to be set on a lampstand? There is nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret, but that it should come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Then he said to them, take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you, and to you who hear, more will be given. For whoever has, to him more will be given. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Is it important that we listen, that we hear the word of God, that we allow it to penetrate our hearts, our minds, our thoughts, that we respond to it correctly? Yes. Because eventually, if we refuse to hear, God will grant our wish. He, he did it for the, the people of Israel. He would do it for us. It, it is not, it is punishment. It is, it is judgment. Let's be thankful for the word of God and be thankful that, that he allows us to hear it, that he allows us to respond to it. Amos chapter 9. He promised them that judgment was coming and now Amos delivers the description. I saw a vision of the Lord standing beside the altar. He said, Strike the tops of the temple columns so that the foundation will shake. Bring down the roof on the heads of the people below. I will kill with the sword those who survive. No one will escape. Sounds like pretty complete judgment. Even if they dig down to the place of the dead, I will reach down and pull them up. Even if they climb up into the heavens, I will bring them down. Even if they hide at the very top of Mount Carmel, I will search them out and capture them. Even if they hide at the bottom of the ocean, I will send the sea serpent after them to bite them. Even if their enemies drive them into exile, I will command the sword to kill them there. I am determined to bring disaster upon them and not to help them. Your heart would have to be pretty hard to hear that from God and say, No big deal. We'll survive. (laughs) The Lord, the Lord of heaven's armies, touches the land and it melts and all its people mourn. we, we, We rightfully try to sing and praise and glorify and magnify the Lord and, and, um, Express how great he is. But realize that how great he is works against us if we fight him. It's a good thing to praise him, glorify him, and and realize he is the Lord of hosts. He's the Lord of heaven's armies. And, And truthfully, 
we get to be on his side. It's probably not the best way to say it, he's on our side. Because <laughs> frankly, <laughs> my side's not a good side to be on. <laughs> I'd rather be on his side. Right? But we get to be on his side, and he is terrifying to his enemies, and he is powerful and, and magnificent. But do you want to be on the other end of that? No. The ground rises like the Nile River at flood time, and then it sinks again. And uh, um, there's, there's, there's total destruction there, okay? I mean, we, we've seen it to a small extent with the flooding that we've had and just water racing through, All right? Hidden in that is that's what makes the Nile River basin so fertile, right? God uses that, right? So there's a tiny hint that there might be some good that comes from this. The Lord's home reaches up to the heavens while its foundation is on the earth. He draws up water from the oceans and pours it down as rain on the land. The Lord is his name. Are you Israelites more important to me than the Ethiopians, asked the Lord? And their answer would be, yes. Didn't you just tell us that we were, of all the nations of the earth, you chose us. We're your special people. Of course we're good to you. We're, we're, <laughs> and the Lord goes, do you remember I brought Israel out of Egypt? And they're like, yes, that is the great story of redemption in the Old Testament. That is the thing that we look to, our most powerful, our most high God. No other God has ever done that. No other God has ever done that for any nation. And God says, I, I am the most high God. But let me remind you of this. I also brought the Philistines from Crete. And at that, you've got to like, oh, Oh my, isn't Philistia our enemy? Don't we have trouble with giants? And uh, God brought them from Crete to Philistia. God brought them from... And led the Arameans out of Ker. I, the sovereign Lord, am watching the sinful nation of Israel. I will destroy it from the face of the earth. But I will never completely destroy the family. Because they are his people. But they need to be disciplined. They need to be judged. Verse 9. I will give the command and will shake Israel along with the other nations as grain is shaken in a sieve. Yet not one true kernel will be lost. Right? So the good news in the judgment is the Righteous will be saved. Hey Abraham, I'm going, Abram, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh God, if there are 70 righteous people there, could you spare the city? Oh God, if there are 10. <laughs> Let's go with 10. Can I hear five, three, one? All right. I didn't get that low. But you know what? God doesn't destroy the righteous. Right? Lot escapes. And it's hard for me to imagine, but Hebrews says that he was a righteous man who vexed his soul with the pleasures of Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay? I'm sure God often looks at me the same way. But the righteous will survive. Yet not one true kernel will be lost. All the sinners will die by the sword, but all those who say nothing bad will happen to us. Do you notice that it's shifted? Condemnation, it's coming, it's going to be total, it's going to be, but, but, from verse 8 on, right, the, the last half of verse 8, there's really a, a shift, there's a reminder that, hey, I, I know that I've got to judge, I know that I've got to destroy, but, the righteous remnant I will I will redeem 
Verse 11, in that day I will restore the fallen house of David. I will repair its damaged walls. From the ruins I will rebuild it and restore its former glory. And Israel will possess what is left of Edom and all the nations that I have called to be mine. The Lord has spoken and he will do these things. The time will come, says the Lord, when the grain and grapes will grow faster than they can be harvested. <laughs> um, we are blessed. And if you, you think through the promises of God to the people as they come into the promised land, and you think through the grapes the size of watermelons, and you, know, and, and you realize how many vacation days that God gave his people, the only way that he could have sustained that and sustained them was that he would have blessed them super abundantly above what we think we can get out of the ground. Okay, So Israel's put time and money and resources into making their land fertile, which wasn't, right? And they think that they've done great things, and they have done great things, uh, pulling nothing from them. But they've not seen anything like what happens when God says 30, 60, 100 fold. Right? I, I told you about the year that I planted potatoes, and I planted five, and I got five. And I thought, this is not worth it. And it wasn't. It's not at all. But I, I really don't know what I would have said if I had planted five, and God had given me 500 potatoes out of those buckets. I don't know how the buckets would have hold, held 500. But what I do see from this is that God could have done it. All right? What he's telling them is, is that they... He will, he will prosper them after he's punished them. The terraced vineyards on the hills of Israel will drip with sweet wine. I will bring my exiled people of Israel back from distant lands. They will rebuild their ruined cities and live in them again. They will plant vineyards and gardens. They will eat their crops and drink their wine. I will firmly plant them there in their own land. I, and they will never again be uprooted from the land I've given them, says the Lord your God. And finally, the promise that God said, if you will obey me, I will give you this land. And we're not there yet, but God calls 144,000 to testify, and he turns the hearts, and he takes the veil away from the eyes of Israel, and they turn, and they turn to him, and they, they repent. They can't believe that they have crucified the Messiah. This is what Revelation tells us. And they finally turn. And they finally get it. And God plants them in the land. And they'll never be uprooted. And it just seems like a long time for God to carry out his promise. But God's God. Right? He doesn't forget. Unfortunately, he doesn't forget that he has to punish as well. All right. The last interactive slide for the evening close your bible you can keep your phone open no <laughs> so i thought this this is i I've tried to think through this famine of the word of the lord so i just look looking for someone who give me a list of 50 verses i came across this one um let me give her, her credit. Sheila Ray Gregoire. Uh, 50 most important Bible verses to memorize. Her, her blog is To Love, Honor, and Vacuum, um, which I think is a great title. Uh, <laughs> uh, you look at this list, and most of them, hopefully most of them, you're thinking, oh yeah, I know that one. I can get that one. I'm pretty sure I know what that one is. So I just want you to think through. Do you recognize them? I mean, this, this is part of the reason why we make kids learn references in Awana. <laughs> right? If it had just the first verse, words, some, some of them would be much easier. I, I understand. I do. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, if it's and, but, for, either, or. <laughs> Sometimes that's really hard, too. But 
Anyone want to quote one? Amen. That's a very, very foundational, important verse. No one comes to the Father except through me. When you were quoting 1 Corinthians 10.13, I, I looked to see if 1 Corinthians 10.31 is up there because that, that, that's one that flips in my mind all the time. But, you know, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all for the glory of God. Right? So, I just challenge you. We're about to start our Awana year and we're going to make our kids memorize verses. Which is a great thing that shouldn't be just for children. <laughs> I need I need the reminder as well. Um, so let's work on committing God's word to our hearts, which is Psalm one nineteen eleven. <laughs> Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Let's pray, Father God. We thank you. I, I thank you. It's true for many of us. Most of these verses come back to our minds because we've learned them long ago and have just had them repeated and burned into our memories by your Holy Spirit and we are grateful for that and Father help us not to just let it go we're not too old to learn new verses we're not too old to stop hearing your word because we're reminded again tonight that our response to hearing your word determines your response. And Father, we do not want a famine of the Word of God. Help us to proclaim your Word this week. We give you praise, honor, and glory in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you so much. Next Sunday night, uh, Ken and Sarah will be giving their uh, update. Um, the week after that, I believe, is X. No, 19th. We'll start Hosea and uh, see what God has for us there. Um, that's one of my favorite books, but we'll see how, how we tackle it. I have no idea yet. <laughs> All right, thank you. We are dismissed.